Okay, we seem to have uh, plateaued the number of participants. I'm sure that some other ones will be joining. Um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Randall Krantz. I'm a senior advisor at the Global Maritime Forum on Decarbonization. And I have helped uh, over the past uh, two and a half, almost three years, set the foundations and eventually the actual structure and delivery of the Getting to Zero Coalition, which uh, has now been running for very nearly a year since its official launch, which is uh, in itself very exciting, not the year that we thought it was going to be. Um, but, uh, but here we are, instead of having this as a live panel, we're having it as a Zoom panel. And uh, the topic of today's panel is on engine technologies and onboard systems. This is a webinar um, an insight briefing, as we call it, uh, that is part of an ongoing series that is being held by the Getting to Zero Coalition um, by the Fuels and Technologies Workstream. And so today we're going to be talking about the uh, role of engines and propulsion technologies that will need to be developed and deployed over the coming decade and decades. Um, the focus of this is really going to be on the future internal combustion engines. There's a lot to be said about other alternative technologies, which will not be the core focus of this, so such as fuel cells and uh, other power options, and those will be explored in greater detail on a, uh, another future webinar. Um, there is a briefing paper that helps outline some of the issues that we'll be discussing. I'm hoping that my colleague Emma can pop the link of that into the chat that you should all be able to see. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to have a look at that, um, then you can do so. That might help you come up with some thoughts, questions, perspectives, or get caught up on the topic. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce my speakers. Um, so I'll introduce them in the order that they will be speaking. The format of this webinar will be that each of the speakers will speak for a few minutes. Uh, I will have some Q&A question and answer with the speakers to engage and tease out some of the um, nuances and other issues around, around the discussions and their points. And then uh, what we will have is we will have then an open Q&A from the floor, from the panel, uh, sorry, from all the participants who will be uh, requested to submit questions via the chat box. So if you're listening in on this and you will have a question to ask, throw it in the chat box and we will be collecting those and seeing how many of those we can answer in the one hour now, 55 minutes that we have ahead of us. So uh, with that, I will introduce uh, Dorotha, Dorotha Jakobsen from uh, MAN Energy Solutions, Matteo Natali from Wartzela, uh, Odin Wong from DSME Shipyards, who is still in the process of joining with some technical difficulties, so we expect him to be joining shortly, uh, Christian Oldendorf from Amplifier Labs in Berlin, uh, Jerry Doherty from Ardmore Shipping in Ireland. And so with that, um, I will hand over to Dorota, who is going to talk a little bit about her experience at MAN Energy Solutions. Just so everybody knows, it says it in the upper left-hand corner, but this conversation is being recorded, and we will be uh, using this recording to make a summary, and it will be made available online so your colleagues and others can reference it afterwards. So with that, Dorota, over to you. Thank you. And to take yourself off mute when you speak. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, I'm Dori Agapsen from uh, MAN Energy Solutions, and, and this is the webinar that we are uh, in uh, today. Um, I will hopefully, uh, yes, talk about uh, engine technology and, and, and future fuels. Um, a little bit about uh, our business in a global uh, context, uh, the future fuels, our, the journey that we have been in uh, from the, from the two-stroke side, something on uh, drivers uh, for change because uh, this is a, a big change and uh, we need drivers uh, to, to move. This was the ammonia as fuel for marine is just backup uh, information for the conversation that we may have uh, later. We will not have time for this uh, just now. Here you can see uh, that we have uh, been preparing uh, so that we have engines for almost all of the uh, fuels that uh, are out there uh, and also some of the future fuels. And, and you can also see here, let me see here, uh, that we are preparing uh, from two-stroke side uh, on uh, uh, developing an engine for ammonia. Uh, and we will have a product in 2023-2024. Uh, 
our Forstrup brothers are also testing uh, so that they can be ready also for the future fuels. This is uh, our goal uh, actually to have engine types for for the fuels that are relevant uh, for marine and, and for four stroke side also for power. One very, very important point is that we need drivers uh, to, to implement technology. Uh, the shipping industry will not move uh, unless there are uh, important drivers and they can of course be money in a business case or it can be uh, regulation saying that this is something that you have to do. For the last uh, 10 years, uh, we have from, uh, from two-stroke side uh, uh, developed uh, engines uh, to be able to operate on, on different types of fuel. And uh, as you can see here, it's uh, both uh, from, uh, from new builds, but also from uh, retrofitting on engines in service. And on, uh, on the uh, lower uh, right corner, you can also see again here that we are developing uh, an engine for the ammonia. We are building our engines uh, with, uh, with the modular uh, design so that we can retrofit uh, uh, to other fuels uh, if, if this is needed uh, in the future. So if you have the uh, engine that is fully electronically controlled, you can rebuild that to uh, other fuels. And you can of course also rebuild a one type of alternative fuel to another, for example, from the, the gas engine, the MEGI, to a methanol engine. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, methane slip from gas engines, so I would like to uh, point you towards our newspaper on, on methane slip. And, and the methane slip is uh, dependent on uh, engine size uh, and, and combustion principle. So uh, you can get a uh, two-stroke engine uh, running by the diesel principle with very low methane slip, a little bit higher for, for engines uh, operating on the auto principle, uh, for, for large engines and for, uh, for smaller engines, uh, they are a little bit higher. This is all described in this paper and you can find it uh, uh, here. Drivers for change. Um, as I said earlier, we need uh, drivers uh, to, to implement. Uh, and here is an example of uh, how it was implemented for, for NOx uh, tier three uh, uh, reduction technology. Uh, you can see here, we from the uh, engine side, we had the first engine on test bed back in 2011. The rules kicked in in 2016. And here you can see how they are starting to get into the market. And, and when implementing uh, new things, there's a, a mix of public pressure, regulation and technology development. So this is what we are facing uh, when, when we are developing uh, new things. And of, course, of course, money can always uh, uh, make things uh, go easier. This with the ammonia, we may come back to that later. So I will stop sharing and leave it to the next speaker. Excellent. Thank you, Dota, for keeping the time and for giving us a succinct uh, overview of the offerings and the developments. And I think it's also useful to see those, uh, those timelines. So when we're looking um, uh, at different timelines, what you presented us there was kind of uptake within, uh, within a 10-year period. We now have a 10-year period between now and 2030 when we're looking to have the first uh, commercially viable zero emission vessels uh, on the water as a goal of the coalition. So in an appropriate period of time from for potentially going to from development successfully through to uh, deployment in that time period, as you suggest, with the right drivers. And so there's a lot to be said around those drivers as well. Um, now I'd like to um, step over to Matteo from uh, Varsala. Matteo, if you could talk to us a little bit about from your perspective, uh, different engine manufacturer, different uh, markets, um, and, uh, and probably some, some different perspectives. So please. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first question, uh, can you see the screen? Meaning that the power, the what, what can you see? The PowerPoint presentation? We see the PowerPoint presentation, although it is uh, a little bit, we're seeing kind of the top and bottom as well. So if you either squish the window to the right size or go into presentation mode, maybe it's just squishing your window so it's more rectangular than square, uh, that would be useful. But otherwise, I think we can see it. That's much better. Great. Okay, fantastic. Uh, again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matteo Natali, and uh, I'm heading the business intelligence team. 
in Barcelona. Uh, now we'll quickly go through a couple of slides and um, I will highlight the importance of implementing few flexible solutions already today. And uh, I will explain why the reciprocating engine and in particular the dual fuel engine um, is the best technology to achieve it. So if we look at the IMO targets for 2030, it is quite clear that we can achieve compliance already today through a combination of technology. So last generation engine and propulsion system, LNG, batteries and energy management system, route optimization, slow steaming for just in time arrival and so on. Uh, but if we go beyond it, if we look at the 2050 greenhouse gas targets, then green fuels have to be considered. And of course, by green fuels, we mean uh, uh, either synthetic fuels produced only with renewable energy or fuel produced from, from uh, sustainable biomass. Um, what will be uh, the future fuel? Um, the industry is now exploring a number of options. So we are exploring green hydrogen, green ammonia, green methanol, biomethane, uh, synthetic methane, biodiesels, and so on. Uh, what is clear as per today is that there is no silver bullet. Uh, the fuel palette will increase in the future and there will be more fuel options available. And there is no consensus, at least today, on which of them will be the most widely utilized. Uh, the reason for that is that it really depends on a wide number of factors. Uh, one can be the geographical location. So national interest, incentives, legislations, and availability of the fuel feedstock. Um, then we have the impact on the capex and the opex and uh, the impact on the vessel structure as well um, in terms of what is actually needed to deal with a certain fuel complexity uh, linked with cryogenic or toxicity for example. And, um, and of course the fuel choice will also depend on the specific vessel operations. If we look at the energy density of different fuels we see that LNG uh, is and will be the most realistic uh, green fuel for ocean going vessels, while uh, coastal shipping, for example, might or will certainly explore um, other alternatives as well. Um, so how to deal with this level of uncertainty? Uh, alternative fuels uh, have to be certainly kept into account already today when we design a new vessel. Um, after all, you know, if we look at the IMO targets, uh, we need to bear in mind that 2030 is, is tomorrow and 2050 is just one, oh, sorry, one vessel lifetime away. So in order to mitigate these business risks uh, associated with fuel related uncertainties, it is fundamental to invest in fuel flexible solutions. And as per today, the most uh, fuel agnostic technology, that's the most flexible technology available, is the combustion engine, and especially the dual fuel engine, uh, which enables to use the auto cycle and the diesel cycle and to burn both liquid and gaseous fuels. And of course, it doesn't need, if it works with an auto cycle, any after treatment or any abatement for the, for the NOx. Um, so th there's nothing on the market which can give you the same level of freedom and with minor retrofits a dual fuel engine can be adapted to burn a huge variety of different fuels. Uh, however, fuel flexibility is so much a matter of engine as it is a matter of tanks. Uh, we can burn whatever we want in the engine but we have to store the energy on board uh, somewhere. Thus the focus should be on the system as a whole. And actually fuel tank is perhaps, is perhaps the most difficult thing to change during a retrofit project. Uh, if you don't install a pressurized tank on board the vessel, it is then very complex to adapt it you know, afterwards throughout the vessel life cycle. Um, for example, uh, on the other end, if we install an LNG tank, then it can very easily be utilized for ammonia. Uh, so it is very, very important for equipment manufacturers like Barzila, like us, and, and shipyards to work in close cooperation in order to offer uh, what we call an upgrade path uh, to allow the customers, so the ship operators, to keep different fuel options open throughout the vessel life cycle. So uh, I think I almost ran out of time, so I would like to conclude with some key takeaways. Uh, first one, there is no single future fuels. There will be a whole variety of fuels in use. And considering the average vessel lifetime, it is 
essential to invest in fuel flexibility already today. And a dual fuel engine is the more flexible and future-proof technology that we have at the moment. And based on this technology, we must and can offer uh, an upgrade path to our customers to mitigate compliance and business-related risks introduced by new fuels. And of course, last but not least, uh, when we want to ensure a certain level of flexibility, tanks and, tank and, and, and fuel engine system is as important as the engine. Uh, so we need to think at system level. And uh, yes, I want to thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me here. <laughs> thank you, Matteo. That is uh, extremely useful framing. Um, interesting to hear, of course, there's no silver bullet. That does not come as a surprise, but your uh, focus on the um, uh, energy, uh, the, sorry, the the systems as a whole and the upgrade path that can kind of take us there is something that's really interesting and it takes us to our next speaker um, uh, so Odin Kwon who is joining us by telephone and, um, he, and my colleague Emma will share his slide so Odin I'm not sure whether you're able to see the screen. If not, just call out your slides by number and Emma will be able to uh, take us through them. Um, and so Odin Kwon from DSME Shipyards in South Korea, I hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm CTO of DSME, but unfortunately, I guess the suddenly coronavirus attacked my computer system. So I couldn't join this Zoom, but I'm on the phone. So I'm very honored to be here to give uh, our result of zero carbon design of 23K uh, container vessel using ammonia as fuel. As you may know well, uh, ammonia cargo can be carried by LPC carrier, and we have built many uh, VLGC in our shipyard. And uh, so recently, MAME has introduced the MAGIP engine just before, driven by LPG as fuel. And we are now design and construction. And also, my friend of Fasila also developed the four stroke uh, ammonia engine. So it can be also easily modified to ammonia burning engine by 2023. I don't know how much uh, EG, something like that. So can you show the next slide? So currently there are a lot of the ammonia export and import terminals, and uh, Singapore will be the first runner of the bunkering. So still a lot of the uh, infrastructure already. So then uh, for the next slide, uh, so international rule and regulations uh, in place covering the use of ammonia on board. However, ammonia is not covering by the rules and regulations as a fuel, so we have to amend of the, uh, the rule and regulation to introduce the ammonia as a fuel. So next slide. So in order to consider ammonia as a fuel, new system is required, such as high speed space separator, heaters, boosters, venting system, SCL, etc., etc., etc. So concrete facility uh, should be provided and the storage system is uh, very similar as the LPG tank. So uh, I think uh, currently uh, LPG carrier can be utilized as an ammonia carrier, but also the ammonia fuel tank uh, easily adopted as a uh, current uh, LPG tank system. Next slide. Uh, as you can see the, this table, liquid ammonia has a relatively low volume energy density and they require almost uh, four times a larger tanker compared to the conventional fossil fuel is required. In case of LNG, uh, also 2.3 times a large tank fuel is required. So, but uh, you know, the hydrogen is a big, big uh, volume is required for fuel. Next slide. 
there are three major risks of ammonia fuel. Uh, but ammonia is not new to shipping. However, we have to design the vessels carefully for inflammability, uh, toxicity, uh, corrosion issues. Ammonia is a CO2 and uh, SOX free, but NOX, N2O, and the possible sleep of ammonia from funnel. So, catalyst and SCR to be applied to ammonia fuel design. Next. So, we have done successfully a hazard hazard JDP workshop with Lloyd Class and NANES for ammonia fuel, the 23K container ship in June and July this year. So we did a lot of calculations and diagram and drawing, analysis, procedures, etc. And next slide. I hope this kind of aggressive study and JDP will be uh, one of the big steps of the zero carbon future. And I'd like to contribute of this green society. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So if you have any question, I'll let you know later. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you, Odin, for that presentation. It's, uh, it's exciting to see that this is being thought of in terms of real vessels on the water with real timelines, and that uh, although the list of challenges is, uh, is, is long, it is finite, and that those are, are being addressed and explored. Um, I'd like to turn to our two perspectives from, uh, from ship owners. Uh, I'll start with Christian Oldendorf, Christian Oldendorf from Oldendorf Shipping, but also from Amplifier Labs, um, which is bringing in an interesting perspective because of the need for um, investment and in, on the R&D side and how does this transition happen and, and what can we do to accelerate it? Uh, Christian, over to you. Thank you, Randall. Uh, first of all, thank you for including me in this uh, distinguished round. Uh, I feel quite honored to, to adding my perspective. Uh, to myself, I'm co-owner of Rira Nord, currently running 70 ships in the area of containers, bulkers, and tankers. Uh, three years ago, we founded uh, Amplifier, which is a venture capital fund focused on supply chain innovation. Uh, we, can, uh, we can say from that perspective, that's not just maritime, it has the challenge are trying to find new fuels and try, trying to find uh, ways of integrating it, but you'll find it in trucking, you'll find it on uh, other forms of transportation, and uh, there's a major efficiency element to be had if the integration of all parts work well. Um, in order to understand how to, how to navigate uh, an un unclear future on the maritime side, we decided to create a, a coalition with uh, the ETH, uh, with ABB, and with Equinor, a couple of other partners that we uh, that we called it towards net zero, very similar to getting to zero. Our goal was to uh, try and spur discussion within the industry on how to uh, develop concepts that could be future ready, not just for 2050 or 2030, but within this decade, uh, well before the 2030 deadline. Our um, our idea was trying to understand how to integrate several parts of the supply chain, not just the, the maritime side, but also the energy side into uh, finding ways to, 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 uh, to integrating uh, all sides. Um, the major challenge, of course, are the ship owners trying to reduce emissions. Uh, the regulation is the main driver. It also, the question is how to, how to digest the initial costs of, uh, of R&D and also putting, uh, putting the business case together. Currently, there's very few opportunities to making the business case work. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, discussions need to be had on how this can be financed. The the pure venture capital side is unlikely to to be an investment source uh, as their returns uh, and scalability on the hardware side are likely not in the same realm as uh, as uh, in line with the returns uh, on on venture capital expectations. So there's a, a large need for going for government grants and subsidies in order to make this work. Therefore, large consortia work in a, in a very good way. The issue for us is, of course, um, when what to invest today. If we buy a ship today, we need to understand what fuel it will digest. We need to understand how within its maintenance cycles we can upgrade it and create further efficiency in order for it to reach its targets. And uh, as it reaches its, in its lifetime, 20, 25 years plus, how there can still be, be, uh, be a sufficient value in it so we can, we can sell it at a, at a price at which it will make our initial 
return worthwhile. Um, our current structure, uh, working with Towards and Zero, is uh, an Earth initiative in which we uh, like to drive change in the industry, spur discussion, and integrate. Our current proposal is the use of an electric engine driving a ship, who will use a variety of energy sources, all of which will be containerized uh, as power sources as well as tanks, similar to a container cargo, and connected to the drivetrain to deliver the power to drive the electric engine. These fuels can be initially fuel oil, diesel oil, uh, LPG, uh, LNG, uh, yet also in the future it can integrate hydrogen and ammonia depending on availability in the port. Containerizing the power delivered delivery units will make it possible to gradually source in zero emission fuels depending on availability without having to change the ship's infrastructure too heavily. Supplying the fuels in such a way will also reduce the need for an onboard maintenance, which will therefore reduce crew costs. Maintenance could be done ashore as the containers can be taken on and off the ship uh, as as the, as, the, as the route uh, is navigated. Um, we still, uh, we're, in the, we're still working on our, our more design concepts. We will be uh, applying for a 10 million EU, Euro, uh, EU grant, uh, which will be decided pretty soon, and hope to come back with you with further information a bit more detailed as we go along. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. And maybe just one follow-up question to that. Containerization sounds like it's something that would be very specific and so if somebody goes that route then uh, they might be locked into that so to speak um, which then probably means that you that the concept which would hopefully be kind of open sourced and, and modular would then be need an uptake by a certain amount of the the market of course so is that something that you've looked into in terms of just kind of the early stage modeling of what would allow this solution to potentially be successful yeah, absolutely. So if I understand you cor correctly, um, the, your, your, your question regards, uh, regards the commitment that it would take to create the infrastructure uh, to, to drive an electric engine through containerized power sources. Is that right? That's right. And if doing so then precludes you from a, no, you know, a more conventional route that our two engine manufacturers, for example, were, were mentioning, and then therefore mm -hmm. you're making a decision and, uh, and, and what would that uh, entail and how would that uh, potentially move forward in terms of timelines? Absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, you commit yourself to, to quite a substantial change of, uh, of engine setup. But um, in our mind, the shipping is not an isolated industry and uh, depending on, on the route that, you, that you'd have to, uh, have, to, uh, have to go and uh, the ports you'd have to uh, refill your, your fuels in, uh, will will dictate uh, the, the the fuel that you'll take. If there's only diesel available, then you could use your diesel containerized power units. If you'd be able to integrate hydrogen, ammonia along the way, you could reduce your emissions on the way and also create a pathway for energy suppliers to be those to supply that power in a power by the hour concept. Uh, first of all, opening up a major realm of business for, for power companies. And second of all, being able to give them a pathway to sell their energy that they produced uh, along the way uh, in a relatively short cycle. So um, if you look at regular, uh, regular uh, maintenance cycles of five years, these are long planning horizons that might not be able to, we might not be able to commit to taking the power of, of uh, energy companies that could provide clean energy offshore. We believe through this, uh, we, could, we could break it, break it down to smaller parcels than, uh, than, uh, than one big commitment at a, in a five year period. Excellent. Thank you, Christian. And it's, it, it is exciting to know just, you know, that there's disruptions. This clearly, if successful, is a, is a huge disruption, but it's really exciting to know that there is a, that there's a wide variety of, uh, of choices. We don't know which ones can be successful. There probably is a lot of room for things to happen in parallel. I just wanted to also welcome Odin on video. So thank you, Odin, for getting that video working. That's great. Um, and what I'd like to do is turn to our last speaker before I go to some of the questions that we've got in the chats. Thank you for everybody who's putting those questions in. Thank you for our uh, Getting to Zero colleagues who are actively uh, colleagues and, uh, and, and other uh, members who are helping to answer some of those questions as they come up. And with that, then uh, Jerry from Ardmore Shipping, over to you for our final presentation before we open the discussion. Thanks, Randall. Um, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And uh, Randall, once again, thanks very much for the opportunity on behalf of our board to, you know, put our kind of points across um, in today's forum. <clears throat> I think, you know, listening to the, the my previous uh, fellow speakers, there's a lot of very interesting points um, and very interesting possibilities that we have ahead of us um, between the next, certainly within the next 10 years. Um, I don't want to focus on too much of, you know, 
what we've done to date in Ardmore, but you know, we have been fairly proactively involved in various different fuel optimization techniques uh, through both hardware and software to date. But of course, we realize that the, you know, these alone will not be sufficient to get us to where we need to get to next. Um, we have looked at various different other technologies. Um, I won't go through them all in detail, but you know, from wind technologies through to you know, shore power, we're, we're involved in the background and again, looking at various different technologies as well. But I think the purpose of today is really looking at, in terms of the reciprocating engine, where do we see things going from here? Um, so, you know, the, as the previous speakers have mentioned, there's various different aspects and, and drivers that will, you know, determine where ship owners, uh, you know, what decisions they will reach and why they reach those decisions. You know, I, I suppose probably the most important one for us as a ship owner moving forward is what, what's the availability of potential fuels? If we look at dual fuel engines, what, what's the potential availability and infrastructure going to look like, you know, between five and 10 years from now? Um, obviously, we, we hear that, you know, many different engines at the moment we can run on LNG. That may be suitable for ships on a, a specific line of trade. Um, it maybe doesn't suit everybody. For us, for example, we have a 26 ship fleet and we're on the spot market. So very often we're in ports that, you know, the infrastructure may not be as developed as it may be in the kind of major hub ports. So that's something that we have to take into account. And possibly to Christian's point there, it's, it's looking forward when we look at specific installations, it's having the flexibility and adaptability to, you know, future proof, let's say, um, any investment decisions we make down the line. Um, you really, from, from our point of view, we were following very closely the engine manufacturers' uh, developments with regard to you know, methanol, ammonia. We know there are ships out there at the moment um, burning methanol, um, and you know, we look forward. I think the time frame at the moment, if I'm not mistaken, that we're looking at for ammonia engines is circa early 2024. Um, for first engine rollout. So that, that's something we are very keen to keep an eye on. Um, again, there are, we hear different voices within the industry of concerns regarding ammonia, whether it be flexibility, availability, infrastructure, or the toxicity issue um, within certain ports. Um, but you know, I think we, we have to be open to all potential options. Certainly from a ship owner's point of view, you know, if we look back to the, the recent change, the 2020 fuel changeover, I think one of the things that we face as an industry is that we, we can tend to be very reactive uh, as an industry. And there's a lot of, I'll sit back and wait to see what other people are going to do before I make a decision to implement change, you know, from, from our side. And I think as we move into this particular decade, I think as an industry, whether it be ship owners, whether it be shipyards such as DSME, engine manufacturers, as we have here, I think we all have to be far more proactive uh, moving forward. You know, the more we have open discussion, open communication, I think that the easier it will be to implement change. Um, there is this propensity, as I say, for people to, you don't necessarily want to show your cards, but I think we're at the stage now, uh, looking at the timeframes we have in front of us, we, we don't have time to sit back and wait and see. We have to be more proactive than we traditionally have been as an industry in the past. And I think that's one of the most important key issues that we need to address as an industry to you know, have that proactive approach from this moment onwards, to be honest. So that's a kind of review of, from a ship owner's perspective where we are without wanting to get into too much detail. Jerry, thank you very much. And uh, I mean, you've, you've essentially done a, a plug for the Graving to Zero Coalition because certainly we are established so that we can have the dialogue, so that we can look across the entire value chain and engage all the stakeholders. And we have a good group of stakeholders on this call, but also in, in the chat, we have our, our colleagues from Shell. We have the whole fuel supply chain. There's a need for the banks to be on board. We can't have everybody on each call, but um, the, the coalition certainly has that depth and, and this idea of how do we be, uh, how do we be proactive? And, and one of the important things about the Getting to Zero Coalition is that it is a coalition of the willing. It is a coalition of those that have high ambitions, that share that ambition, and that want to move forward together. And so 
this conversation uh, and many other conversations are, are here entirely for that purpose to how do we catalyze change? How do we move forward? How do we uh, accelerate? So, so thank you, Jerry. Thank you to all of the speakers. Uh, what I'd like to do is we've had a, a series of questions uh, coming in and um, uh, some of them are uh, a little bit technical and might have shorter answers. So I'll kind of run through some of those. Some of them I will direct to um, certain speakers, but if you have something to add um, from, the, from one of the panelists, please, please do jump in. So um, uh, one of them from uh, Klaus uh, Winter Graugard was, um, says, uh, this came in through the chat, it says it is expected that DF engines, uh, both four and two stroke will be able to burn uh, ammonia and fuel oil uh, and switch between these products. Uh, is it expected that that will happen uninterrupted and smoothly as we do with LNG or LPG or is it, would it be in some other modality? Um, and I know that there may not be an answer to this because that switching has never been tried before because the engines I know are, are still in villain process, but maybe um, uh, Dorto to you and then uh, Matteo if you have a comment on that. We are expecting that it will be the same as for the other fuels, uh, a smooth uh, transition. Yeah, I'm fully in line with what Dorothy said. Same okay. is for us. Great, thank you. So simple uh, answers to some of these. Um, there was uh, uh, another question around methane slip um, from Tue Johannesson, which was basically saying, uh, so methane slip from LNG engines or vessels is one part of the picture and, and the, clearly there's work on that and there's a, a certain amount of control that can be brought into that. Um, how much slip of the overall supply chain is taking place on the vessel and consequently, how much slip is out of the control of, uh, uh, of this group and potentially this coalition? Is that something that is known? I'm hearing that uh, the uh, uh, the person with the question is asking for a life cycle analysis of, of LNG and and what is uh, what is part of the engine which is is here and then there's the ship and then there's uh, the production side and and maybe also you can put in bunkering uh, is is this uh, the question? So my understanding of the question is that it's looking at methane slip across that supply chain and how much of the methane slip is on the ship versus elsewhere in that supply chain. Should we know that? Maybe we can refer to, uh, unless Matteo, you can answer. Uh, I, I will not be able to give something uh, uh, suitable, but maybe you can, Matteo, or, or yeah. otherwise, uh, Tristan? I, I think that multiple studies have been done on, uh, on meth and sleep uh, emissions throughout the whole uh, supply chain, so also including the upstream part. Um, of course, this is something, I mean, the, the upstream part is something that has been taken care by you know the relevant parties what we are focusing on is what is happening on the vessel and uh, i can tell that the improvements that have been done on that side has been um, has been massive if you look at the latest numbers of methane slip values they are nowhere near what was published by iccp for example and the ambitions for the forthcoming years is to further reduce it down to basically neg negligible levels Great, um, so let me try to get some questions that are kind of more broader. So, so one is a question, um, there was a question around ammonia and the need for a, uh, a pilot fuel. Um, and the questions were, so when using ammonia, is there a need for a pilot fuel? And, um, and uh, yeah, what, would, what might that be? And, and how much volume would that be? Yes, there will be a need for a pilot fuel uh, operating on, on ammonia. We do not know yet uh, how much. Uh, we are expecting it will be in the uh, same range as uh, for, the, for the other fuels, but of course we don't know yet because we haven't tested. And then there was a last question. It was just related to that. It was, it was what would it be and how much would you need as in... Uh, and which type. Yeah, and, which type. And uh, it would be a fuel that is uh, easy to, uh, to burn. So uh, diesel-like uh, uh, fuel, uh, biofuel of some kind or power to X or something. Okay, excellent. And there's a question. Uh, Maybe Matteo also would like to uh, say from Foster side. Yeah, uh, well, we started engines uh, testing on ammonia on, uh, in March this year. Uh, so the, the quantity of pilot fuels to be used still to be still to be evaluated or yeah. that is published. So I, I'm not able to give an answer 
do an exact and detailed answer now. And, and maybe Odin, um, bringing this to you, if you're looking at this from a systems point of view, how much of a complication is it to add a pilot fuel in terms of the system? Um, is this something that is, you know, increasing the complexity uh, to the square or just a, an additional tank in some lines and just, just so that people who are not familiar with combustion systems can understand? No, well, um, the dual fuel engines are already, you know, I have this feature uh, built in. So we have uh, a, a, an injection system which is capable of uh, handling multiple fuels, including the pilot fuel. Uh, what we need is a separate tank, but it's, it's a well-proven technology. So I, I don't see that as, a, as an obstacle at all. Okay, and, and a question to all speakers. Uh, sorry, Odin, I, I, I cut you off, please. Uh, hello. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of the pilot fuel, we already made many different types of fuel, fuel engine. For instance, MEJ engine, XPF engine, four stroke engine. So, pilot is not much bigger. And then the fuel supply system is uh, not difficult. Currently, we use a high pressure pipe in engine room or a low pressure pipe in engine room and uh, all the ventilation system. So, fuel supply is not uh, difficulties. But I think the uh, hot water system, whether it's inside of the cell or outside of the cell, but our current study was based on the container ship. It was wholly inside of the vessel. So we also checked everything in terms of the haji, the hazard. So even a certain amount of biofuel, but we can manage it. Thank you. Thank you, Odin. So you're saying that basically this is something that we're dealing with already in multi-fuel systems and uh, we can manage it, it being the key message there. Sorry, Dorta. And then I want I to just, ask a question to the group. And I was just, you know, we are expecting uh, that uh, the ship owners and maybe we can uh, take that over to, to Jerry and, and, and Christian that uh, we are expecting that the ship owners would want to have dual fuel engines so that uh, they can operate both on ammonia, but also if ammonia is not available in this harbor, you can use the traditional fuels so that the ship owners actually want to do a fuel. Yeah, let's, let's take that to, um, to Jerry Christian, if you can comment on that. I mean, obviously we won't have all ports with all fuels at a time. There have been conversations about, do we um, uh, do this on a vessel basis or on a voyage basis? And obviously with dual fuel engines, you can open up the opportunity to do this on a, on a voyage basis. Uh, Jerry, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I, what I would say to that is, yes, I mean, having the dual fuel option certainly provides flexibility. Um, you know, there, there was a question there um, from another uh, participant, um, basically along the lines of, well, you know, how do we as ship owners, if we were going to go and build a ship now, effectively from the way I read the question, it was how can we future proof um, for down, what's coming down the line? The honest answer to that right now at this moment in time is it's very difficult to say. And I know that doesn't specifically answer the question, but having the adaptability of a dual fuel engine certainly does give you scope for further development. Again, a lot of it would come down to what's physically available from engine manufacturers and shipyards at this moment in time. You know, if we were to go and build an MR tomorrow, um, you know, what, what available technology is there for us? What can we do? Because obviously, first and foremost, you know, we have to be tier three compliant at this moment in time, but what can we do to future proof? Um, again, it would come down to, there's a capital investment involved, but as, as Christian alluded to earlier on, we also have to look further down the life cycle of the vessel. Should we look to potentially sell the vessel down the line? Is it going to be a sellable asset? Is there going to be any value in it? Do we, do we remove value by not being as flexible and adaptable as possible? I think these are all questions that have to be considered. I, I don't have the absolute black and white answer to get to anything at the moment in time, but 
certainly these are all considerations that we as, as ship owners would have to take into account. But again, just back to the, the point I made earlier on, I think that's where you know, a, a much more in-depth discussion now with ship owners and shipyards um, and engine manufacturers to look at what the, what the viability of certain options are is, is definitely needed much more proactively than it may have you know, taken place in the past. Excellent. Thank you, Jerry. And, and, I, and that highlights another question that's come in the chat, which was um, uh, from, uh, from, from Charis uh, Plankantonaki I, um, asks, in, in view of the variety of fuels, and we're obviously talking about a range of fuels, um, how do you envisage the training of the engineers who are going to be handling the relevant machinery, so both onboard ships and ashore? Um, and, uh, you know, it, it may be early for this, but, but, you know, is there going to, where's the training going to come from? How's that going to be standardized? What's that going to look like? How many different fuels, you know, are they capable of? Um, we don't have anybody from the ports here, but maybe from, from an onboard perspective, uh, Christian and Jerry, and then uh, uh, others, if you want to weigh in on that. Yes, I'd like to, I'd like to weigh in on, 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 on Gary's point that there's uh, too little being done and that we have to be much more proactive. And uh, looking at uh, discussing engine type is one thing, but of course a lot can be done by reducing uh, the speed of ships, which I'm a heavy proponent of. Uh, if you look at the supply chain, there's, uh, there's, easy, there's easy ways of saving a day, two or three, which will, have substantial impacts on the performance of ships uh, over time. Um, I also do believe that there is a uh, big potential in, in thing, routes uh, going down exploring wind power, which will, um, which will further reduce uh, the, the need for fuels in the future and will have a, have a massive benefit to, to, the, to the environment, to, to the ship owner, to the, to the charter, to the bottom line in, in general. Um, the, the company we work with, uh, BAR Technologies, who built the America's Cup vessel for Team Ineos, they foresee that with the wind power within their simulation capacities, there are savings of 20 to 30 percent, which, which, which is a lot. The, the vessels have to be rebuilt in a different way, but this is um, a, a good first step to understanding how to secure value in, in, a, in a vessel going forward. Looking at it not just from a power perspective, but on a, on a vessel of its entirety, and you can assume that once you can start using wind power, you can generate some electric power back that you can then uh, redistribute into the engines and to other systems. So the the, the step uh, of of finding uh, finding a way into how uh, to invest in the future of, of maritime is to look at the ship as a whole, understand what it is that you're doing, providing a transportation service, and focusing on that in its entirety, and trying to trying to use specialized services uh, to provide the remainder of it. At which uh, to which I would see even running the engine would be something that a ship owner doesn't necessarily have to do himself. He just has to be able to to combine it to a uh, to a ship in the most uh, in the most uh, in the most efficient way. Uh, and for us, this is uh, trying to understand how to make a new energy concept out of a out of a vessel. Thank you, Christian. That idea of an energy concept is is very interesting, and in that we in the future may not be separating our propulsion from all the other needs on a ship, and certainly from the way a ship of, is built in the future, that might be very different as well. And so when we're looking at new builds and beyond retrofits, and, and back to your point, Jerry, how are we going to be able to sell this vessel in you know, 10 years time when it has half of its life to go? Will we be able to sell it? Um, certainly valid. Jerry, did you want to make a comment on the, on the uh, kind of the, the training and the engagement of the, of the human side of this that's, uh, that's going to be equally important? And I suppose that's, there's a technical side on the training, but also a cultural aspect as well. Um, for, for both crewing ships and onshore? Uh, yeah, you know, insofar as the training's concerned, you know, I think we would be regulated by primarily the, the IGC code for most of the, the training requirements. Um, certainly, you know, that we, we've looked at LNG technology in the past for, you know, from a new building perspective, even on an MR, but obviously having sailed in LNGs myself and worked in DSME for a number of years on LNG tanker construction, um, there are safety concerns that our normal guys, let's say, and, and girls on board the ships, um, they're not familiar with, with LNG, the, the safety aspects of it. So there really would have to be a fairly robust training regime put in place. Um, I would say that that would also be similar for fuels such as ammonia, where, you know, there may be toxicity issues. Again, during the, the construction phase and, you know, the design of how we're actually going to lay the plant out, um, the training requirements would be something that we would need to take into account. 
whether that be you know with the engine manufacturers, the vessel designers themselves, um, as well as class and and flag state would all, also have to have a say in the the safety requirements. But yes, I think you know enhancing people's training, um, you know, is it's definitely something that's going to have to come as we as we venture into different fuel types moving forward. Um, just to the point Christian made there, um, the company that he, he had mentioned uh, in regards to the wind technologies, we've actually done some background work with uh, that particular company. And it's, you know, it's a fascinating technology. As a retrofit, we just didn't see it being a retrofit option for us at this moment in time. But, you know, moving forward as shift designs change and whatnot, um, maybe that's something that we can look at more from a new build perspective because it becomes a more attractive investment you know, if, if you're doing it from a new construction point of view. Um, and again, there, you know, there was, there was one specific question there in terms of, you know, moving on to fuels that have different densities and whatnot, you know, it, it has a, an effect on the, the capacity of, let's say, existing um, fuel tank sizes. Again, that, that's something if you were doing it from a new build concept that you would have to take into account so that you could still try to maximise your carrying, uh, cargo carrying capacity, regardless of ship type. Excellent, thank you, Jerry. And, and uh, I'd like to take um, that question about fuel density. And uh, so, uh, NG Desai wrote, uh, considering that ammonia fuel requires uh, more than uh, four times the volume required for oil fuels, how feasible is it as a retrofit from a shipyard perspective? Um, is this something that you're looking at, thinking at, and, and how does it play into the case that you presented to us earlier, Odin? You're uh, muted. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, for first uh, you know, training, you know, the recently we are building the large area area uh, more than 10 vessels a year, uh, maximum almost 19 to 20 vessels. So we are now set up our the training program for the crew members, because still uh, the technology is developed. So how to easily adopt uh, uh, this new technology of gas to the crew members? So we are uh, very much a good uh, program uh, using any AR, VR technology. So whole system can be easily uh, some, uh, studying and uh, well uh, familiar with uh, whole system. So uh, no more issue about uh, the dangerous or uh, something. Even new fuel like ammonia, or we can do also that kind of the uh, training program. And uh, some retrophy, maybe uh, engine manufacturer well known about that. About uh, ammonia engine is very similar as uh, LPG engine because they will use uh, liquid as fuel. Uh, but in case of the LNG, fuel fuel engine, is now using as a gas as a fuel. So quite some problem of the retrofitting. So engine benefits can explain whether the retrofit for future from normal engine to this uh, dual fuel is uh, easy or not. Thank you. Thank you, Odin. So on the training, it sounds like you've got the solutions there. Um, good to know that you're using uh, augmented reality and virtual reality technology, since that seems to be everybody's future. Um, so it sounds like you're ahead of the curve on that one. And on the, the retrofit side, uh, again, possible, but needs to be thought through. Obviously, need to have that engagement across the, uh, across the supply chain. Um, We've uh, got time for one more question before we close. Um, and uh, just checking through the list here, we've had so many good questions. Um, and the, um, the, the one related to that was um, the, I, I think the final question, sorry, that, uh, that, that Christian and Jerry kind of hinted on a little bit was the need to actually accelerate and, and how do we move this forward and, um, and, and in some ways how do we be bold and as we discussed earlier in the conversation that is 
the goal of this, um, of this coalition. So maybe what I'd like to do is run through each of the speakers asking the question, you know, um, what is it that you would like to see that would help you accelerate the commercialization and the deployment of the next generation of engines, including uh, ammonia engines? And I'll, and I'll do that in the same order that we kicked off. So Dorta, then Matteo, then Odin, then Christian, and then Jerry. So kind of a 30 second each answer. Um, what can be done to accelerate this? Um, what would you like to see? I would like to see some orders for, for engines operating on ammonia. That would definitely accelerate every, anything. <laughs> That's a short and sweet answer. Matteo, are you going to say the same? <laughs> well, I, 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 of course I cannot disagree. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I fully agree, but I would, uh, I would really like the discussion to be more open and not focusing just on ammonia. Ammonia is one of the options to be considered for the future, it is a high potential future, of course, but there are other alternatives that have to be kept into account. So what is important now for owners who invest today is to ensure that they have the highest level of flexibility on board in order to make sure that they can keep different options open throughout the vessel life cycle. And as for today, at the DF engine with an LNG vessel is the most easily retrofitable solution to uh, the, the widest possible number of fuels. Uh, because the, tank, the, the the storage system is easy to convert, the engine is easy to convert, um, and so on. So yes, ammonia is one important alternative fuels, but let's keep all the options open. Thank you, Matteo. I think that's very fair, keeping options open. I won't ask you who manufactures that engine you were referring to, um, but uh, obviously there are some options there that will help us. Odin. Yeah, actually, uh, how to accelerate the... Sorry, Odin, you've, um, you were echoing and then I think you got muted on both channels. There we go, just one channel open, please, yeah. again. Actually, how to accelerate uh, to uh, use uh, ammonia or other alternative fuels? First one, uh, requirement like EDI, how to reduce CO2. And second thing will be the carbon tax, like carbon levy. So maybe currently in Korea, the CO2 uh, price is around uh, 15 euro per ton. But maybe future for maritime, maybe hundred dollars per ton, then the, from fossil fuel to new fuels. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Odin. A clear ask for uh, a price on carbon would help that transition. Christian, to you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I echo Odin's, Odin's request for, for clear carbon tax. Um, and I do believe that 100, uh, 100 euros might seem quite high, but uh, if we take uh, the degradation of the environment into account and the effect that shipping has on, on, on the society, plus the potential effect it could have in energy transition, I would also um, also advocate for a three-digit carbon price, but the the immediate thing that can be done is, of course, to create customer demand. So, if there is customers out there who are who are interested in in seriously tackling this issue and are willing to commit to uh, to to um, to joining a consortium of of, uh, of dedicated players from the energy, from the maritime side, from the engineering side, uh, from the from energy supply side. This is uh, exactly what what the industry needs. You need to come together as uh, as as different different uh, different uh, players to actually make an initial concept happen. Try to understand how it works best. Once it works, uh, make sure you communicate this in the right way to broader society and just make just make this uh, make sure the society demands this through through all sorts of uh, of methods. Uh, the customer itself has power but these societies and uh, and states have their own flexibility to to move legislation this way um, but this initial step must be taken to show that this is possible thank you christian and, and that does highlight the role of the um the first movers work stream within the getting to zero coalition which has already catalyzed uh one piece um i see that some people have to drop off uh, so quickly last uh, thoughts from uh, from jerry before we conclude Thanks, uh, Randall. Yeah, just to, to echo what's already been said, I, I think from, from our side, the, the, the main 
key issue here is, is trying to get the, the, the stakeholders sitting around tables um, and proactive, productive groups um, to see, you know, what the way forward is, is going to look like. But I think another point Christian made there, you know, trying to, you know, get the message across to the wider society as a whole. We've seen through the whole COVID-19 crisis how apathetic society seems to be to, you know, getting seafarers on and off ships as key workers. So, you know, I think when it comes to the environment, when it comes to emission control and, you know, improvements down the line, I think possibly we have to be even more vocal as an industry than we are being now um, to, to bring it to a realisation within society of what exactly we're trying to achieve here. Um, you know, because everybody has a start to play in the, in the entire supply chain from start to finish, you know. So, but I think, you know, as, as a starting point, certainly engine manufacturers, owners, shipbuilders, you know, it's, it's important that we really get momentum going ASAP because we, we really don't have any time to waste here. Excellent. And I love hearing that urgency. What we've heard from engine manufacturers is that we can burn anything. We've heard from shipyards, we can build anything. We've heard from both that dual fuel is not difficult. We've already demonstrating that. And from the owners, we're hearing that we need to um, have maximum flexibility, think about the future. Um, overall, to accelerate this, we want to need that we need to coordinate some customer demand, get some orders in, look beyond ammonia very clearly, looking at the to keep our options open, and then obviously this will be accelerated by uh, a price on carbon, and making sure that we include stakeholders and wider society. Thank you very much to my speakers. It was really excellent to have you. We went three minutes over. I apologize to everybody for that. That's entirely on me. But we mm -hmm. did have a really interesting conversation. We had a great group of, uh, of participants and, and a wonderful feed of questions coming in through the chats. Uh, if your questions didn't get answered, these will all get captured. We'll make sure that uh, we're able to contact you. So thank you to everybody. Thank you to my team, to Emma and to Tristan who helped me on the question side and uh, have a great day. Thanks all. Thank you, Randall.